Have you heard about AI? <laughs> the rock band. It's a three-person ro AI rock band, and it, it's actually called AI. So AI is so pervasive. It's everywhere, right? It's in all of your pockets, it's in your hand, or somewhere around you all the time. And today, I was going to cover a little bit about, um, well, there are three th things that I want you to take away from this session today. And it's just going to be 12 minutes, and then we'll have Will join me on stage to talk more about um, the moral code or the ethics around AI. So let me start a little bit with the history of AI. When was the term artificial intelligence introduced? 1956. It comes across as it's new, it's something that's just popped up in the last 10 years, but really AI has been there, you know, as, as a theme or as a concept was introduced in 1956. It's just been, it, it's just taken us time to get to where we are today, right? And what we see a little bit around AI is, you know, there are three types of AI. One is artificial narrow intelligence, and artificial narrow intelligence is a form of AI that can do a very specific narrow task that a human being can do. It could be better than the human, but it's very specific narrow task like playing chess or playing Sudoku or making pancakes or driving a car, right? And the next level of AI is artificial general intelligence, which is a form of AI that can do any task that a human being can do. So, and then the third type is artificial super intelligence, which is a form of AI that can do anything that all human brains combined together can do. So you see where this is going. Today we are primarily in the artificial narrow intelligence phase. Most of the things that you see is a form of narrow intelligence. But what you read about, what the media hypes about, or what, what you really see a lot of buzz around is artificial super intelligence, where AI is gonna take over the whole world. And I'll make it real for you, think of it. AI could be playing chess with me right now. There could be you know, an AI program that's playing chess with me, and even though I'm a good chess player, it could beat me at chess. But if this building catches fire, or if there's a fire, we as humans would all run away and escape, but AI will continue to play chess. So it's very narrow, it is built to purpose, it does what it's supposed to do. So that's the first, first thing to remember about AI. The second thing, I wanna go a little bit even further back into the history. For about 8,000 years, humanity progressed very slowly. There was not much happening. We were progressing as a race. We were progressing in a steady way. Towards the end of the 17th century, there was a major invention, the steam engine. And what that enabled us to do was to extend our human muscle power. We were able to do things that extended beyond what we were capable of doing with our own strength, right? It, it drove a whole new revolution around how we live, how we work, what kind of work we do, who works, how much do we earn, where do we live? There was a huge revolution, right? And to, what I think AI, my strong belief is, is AI is actually going to help us strengthen or extend our intellectual power. So if there's clear parallels here in what you know, AI is enabling us to do. It's really about extending our mental power. And I'll give you some more examples later on. But I want to do a fun exercise, because we hear this term a lot. Change is the only constant in our lives, right? But think about the, ten, uh, the past 100 years. What kind of changes have we seen? And why I believe that AI is gonna take us to that next step and where we are today versus where we will be 100 years from now, potentially. In 1917, can you guess the world's literacy rate? Any guesses? No, it's higher, 
Today, it is at 86%. The average price of a car in 1917. $400. And today, it's, you know, this is obviously compared to last year, but it's close to, you know, 35000 How many houses, not people, had phones? Speak up. I, I know there are people saying. So, 2%, 8%. And today, is there anybody in this room who doesn't have a phone? Oh, there is one person. Oh, wow. OK. <laughs> Global population about 100 years ago was close to 2 billion. And today, it is close to 8 billion. The maximum speed limit in 1917 was Ten miles per hour, and today it's at seventy. The major tech invention. This is my favorite one. The major invention in 1917. Any guesses? Radio. No, it was a toggle light switch, a switch that could be toggled to on and off. That was the single most major invention of 1917. And last year, we invented gene editing, which can reprogram human life as we know it. So change is one constant in our lives. But look at these numbers. Why wouldn't you be optimistic about this change? So. As long as we, as humans, are the ones building that change, driving that change, finding the purpose for that change, I'm extremely hopeful that we will build AI in a way that can actually help us all be better. So that's the second thing. The last thing that I'll cover is really about how to think about work. Because we hear a lot about AI taking away jobs and humans being, you know, removed from jobs and having no existence or being destroyed. But today, if you think about work, it primarily falls into the two buckets, what comes easily to you, what you're able to do, and what pays well. It doesn't really account for that third circle of what do, being able to do what you love. I mean, how many of you have not met a bartender or somebody who is doing that work just to earn a paycheck, but would rather be an artist or a musician or a painter, right? If we are able to build AI in a way that's collaborative, that is be able to work with us to be a, augmenting our intelligence, to take away the routineness, the boring parts of our work while helping us focus on the things that we really enjoy doing, that we're good at, and that also pays well. Can we build AI in a way that can actually enable us to reach that sweet spot in the middle, which is going to cut across all? My belief is yes, that we can. But there's a lot of challenges, obviously, around it, because now we're building intelligence. And that's where you know, the ethical side, the moral side of things come into play. And I want to bring in Will Hayes onto stage to have that chat with me where we're going to really touch on how do we reach the sweet spot, how do we make sure that we're doing all the right things in building AI that's complementing us. Will? Thank you so much. This is, uh, this is so great. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, with, with your organization and, and a lot of what, what we've been talking about in terms of just the human elements yeah. that come in and, and how those have such an impact on the way we're shaping this technology and the applications of this technology. I think one of the, the topics that we've sort of seen coming up over and over again is sort of what does it mean to be human <laughs> in, this, in this period of, of transformation and, and rapid change and, and kind of what, what you were talking about in this 21st century and beyond um, in yeah. this period of AI. 
Yeah, and, and you know, that's, that's a great question, Will. I, I think you know, we, we all struggle with finding that meaning in our lives fundamentally, right? And uh, AI is going to really push us to be more human, is what I think. Uh, because it's going to take away the more boring, monotonous things that uh, we've been doing. If you go, if you think about why computers were invented originally, it was it all started as a calculator, being able to process you know numbers faster, and it really did it. But it's going beyond it. It's taking away all the things that humans are not necessarily good at or enjoy, but it still needs to be done. Right, and being a human in this age would be really bringing out the cu curiosity, the creativity, empathy, things that only humans can do, we'll have more time. I'll give you an example of, um, say, a doctor, right? Uh, today, when you go in, I, I don't know about you, but when you go into the doctor's office, they, they're taking notes, right? They have to make sure they take notes of what were treatment. They also have to, uh, you know, you get about 50% of the time you get that engagement as a human. Right. Uh, but if there was, you know, with all the advances and whether it's voice enabled or video analytics, capturing all this information automatically and processing it for you by a machine, while the doctor is more engaged with you as a person, really, you know, getting into more the empathetic side. I think that's what you will see more changes on the profession. And that's, that's such an interesting correlation with, with, with sort of uh, efficiency, yeah. right? And how, how we, we tend to think of these things being more kind of programmatic in nature, but it actually allows us to kind of touch back into our humanity when we're not distracted by <laughs> all of huh. the things that we sort of need to operate in. I, I think the flip side of that, which is, is both, you know, something to, to address, um, but can also be a concern is that you know, as, as human beings, we, we can often, you know, we, we live in worlds that are where our, our views are impacted by the things around us, right? They're shaped by backgrounds. They can be shaped by gender, by race, by, by social economic background. And yeah. so what, what are your thoughts in terms of how that can transform into bias and then bias can lead into implementation and just sort of that, the chain, the chain reaction that can occur when, yeah. uh, when, we, when we have some of these things kind of slipping into our code or slipping into our thinking? Yeah, and I, th uh, you know, Another great question. Um, look, everybody in this room is biased. I am biased, you're biased. I, I doubt if there's a single person who can say that I'm not biased, right? Bias is shaped you know, right from the time we are born based on how we grow up, our experiences in life, yeah. the people we meet, our friends, our communities. Bias, you know, we form it, right? It's, it's part of us, it's part of who we are. But when you are coding that bias into a program, right? Because when you are trying to put your intelligence into a machine, those biases get carried over most of the time. And scaled. And, and <laughs> scaled exponentially. So how do we make sure, it is so crucial at this point to make sure that those biases, even if they creep in, that they can be kept in check. And that's where I think the whole diversity part comes in. And I don't mean just gender diversity, even though that's the largest demographic, just diversity of thought, diversity of you know, having people, humans, who come from different educational backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, different professional backgrounds, to even out the bias. You know, the more voices, the more diversity of thought we have, who is built? Uh, who is part of de designing and developing AI? You know that that's the only way to address it. Well, in this, you know, we were talking about this backstage, and, and you know, there's a lot of conversation around inclusion and, and tech, and, and even yeah. STEM. And I think one of the, the things that, that you touched on that, that I thought was really exciting is how, you know, in, in, in technology we have so many different backgrounds, right? To bring a product to market, and, and, and all of the different skill sets required. And I think when, when you start thinking about some of these issues around how do I impact things in a more general sense, bring these different points of view, um, there, there's opportunities. Yeah. And there's opportunities to start bringing people into the fold who can implement and work alongside folks who might be more technical in nature. And, and I think this might even touch a little bit into kind of how you founded the, the Humans for AI. So just, just yeah. curious about how you think about the broader opportunity and, and, and really what this means going forward for, for, I think, a more inclusive group of people. Right? Yes, yes. So I, I'll give you a little background on Humans for AI. And it's really you know, a personal cha challenge that I've seen in, throughout my career is the lack of women in tech. Uh, and uh, there seems to be no clear path to solve that problem. In fact, the number of uh, women who are joining to study computer science has 
even further going down. Right, that was one big uh, motivating factor. The other one was in my own life, I've seen uh, two major technology waves uh, create new jobs, uh, the internet and mobile. You know, when I was studying computer science in, uh, I, I'm dating myself here, but in the late 80s, early 90s, there was no job called search engineer, right? There was no job called uh, app developer or iOS developer, and today, those jobs not only got created, they got filled, and they are highly paid jobs. They're very engaging, and uh, you, you all can say, speak to that, right? And I see, you know, so two waves that were created where there were new jobs that got created, uh, two jo waves created new jobs, right? And AI is going to create new jobs as well. Just as it's going to automate and take away some of the jobs, it's also going to create new jobs. And I just feel that if we can proactively train more women and minorities to be able to fill in these new roles, there's a clear path there. The other reason, unlike the internet and mobile, I just, uh, coming back to the earlier question, I feel there needs to be more diversity with, as we are designing and building AI to account some of the, for the biases that creep in. So it's so important. So the goal for humans for AI, so I had this idea about five years ago and I kept Googling to see if there was any company because for me it was just as clear as mud, right? Look, we have a lack of women in tech, there are new jobs going to be created, we've seen this happen in the past two decades, can we create, you know, train more women to fill these jobs? And nobody was doing it. And every time I would see Google saying, oh, we're democratizing AI, I would get really excited, go look at it in depth, but you needed, a, you needed to know Python to understand the, what they were talking about, democratizing AI. That's not democratizing. That's when you are helping a software engineer become a data scientist, and not the entire world is made of software right. engineers, no matter what we think. So how can we actually get non-technical people involved in the AI design and building, development by training them about AI. And I don't see them as data scientists or hardcore software engineers, but more as the product managers, right. project managers, QA, being able to test the algorithms, be, you know, be more at the, you know, at the table, providing their voices, their feedback, so that we can build robust algorithms. Well, and it's, and I talked about this in my, my, my keynote yesterday. I mean, I think the, the, the exciting thing for me in, in, in terms of that, kind of a more in, in inclusive environment that we can build around this particular wave of technology is we all experience it, yes. right? Everybody understands what a good experience is, what a bad experience is, and we, we sort of crafted these expectations, and it doesn't require a computer science degree, it doesn't require Python, or in this case, Java, or you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. All, all of the different, the different pieces that we're used to, but, um, but it's something that I think all folks can sort of engage in. Um, do, do you see a, a responsibility, I guess? I mean, you talk about the Googles and, and the yeah. APs. I mean, um, you know, in, in terms of industry and, and guiding that, because I, I, I feel that without having that movement pushing forward, we sort of go into our kind of default mode, yeah. right? Which is, okay, let's take the computer scientists, let's go make them data, you know, make them data scientists and so yeah. forth. And so, you know, even organizations like ours on the smaller side and you get into these larger corporations, I'm just, I'm curious how you think about, you know, where should we be putting our efforts or our focus to ensure that, you know, this wave starts to shift in the right direction? Yeah, no, that's such a great question. I think there's definitely a desire in, uh, in, in more, almost all the industries. I think it's a, you know, it's a known fact, the more diversity you have, the better your business is, right? And uh, I think the challenge is how, you know, the path to fixing that problem. And, and we tend to get too narrowly focused on, you know, seeing that, you know, you need to be a software engineer to be part of tech, which is, which I think is not true, right? There are so many jobs around you know, to make a, 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 to do a good AI product, you don't need just technologists. You're going to need, uh, you know, all the ancillary functions that feed into it. Um, and uh, it's across the board, I've seen right from large corporations to smaller companies, there's definitely a desire, uh, but it also takes upfront investment. Uh, of being able to train more of the non-technical people to understand, this world, yeah. to understand this world and to be more open. And, uh, you know, going back to the biases question, I, I'll tell you, you know, we as leaders need to be more aware of the biases that we have. 
so I've set up a number of teams from scratch, and I remember during one of the earlier times when I was setting up a team, my first three key hires were all women. And I had to take a pause, step back and say, you know, am I biased? Am I hiring them because they're women and there's a connection here, we had better conversation? Or are they really the true candidates? I think as every leader, you know, becomes aware of it and is able to consciously say, no, I hired because this is the right person. There was no bias there. I think that's at the personal level as well. All right, and you know, I think in, in open source, and, and I, I see this a lot, and I'm often critical of it because there, there's even the, the, the lack of, the, or, or the bias of thought mm. at times. I think when we look for, for candidates, and, and even in the computer science world, um, you know, you tend to go back to the defaults of GitHub accounts and contributions and things, which are, which are fantastic because in some ways they're a very accessible way for people to kind of engage in this community, to demonstrate value, demonstrate skill. But you know, depending on, on your background, and, and for a lot of people that, that I've worked with, it, you know, that they come through more traditional backgrounds because of lack of awareness. You know, I didn't know what open source was. I didn't even know what t technology really was about until I got to college or whatnot. You know, maybe from there I joined a large corporation. Maybe I came up as a you know, level one programmer at some, yeah, some yeah, big yeah. Fortune 500. And you know, there just simply isn't an, an access or an awareness to things like GitHub or open source contributions. And so I, I just, I see that bleeding in, not just around sort of inclusion in, in different backgrounds, but even the way people sort of enter their careers. And I think it's important that we start to think about that diversity of thought, mm -hmm. just as important as diversity of everything else. Because just because someone's not an open source contributor doesn't mean they can't have a huge impact on our community. Um, shifting a little bit, because obviously, you know, we, we're here to talk about AI, and that's a big part of this conference, but data is a big part of this conference. Yeah. And, uh, and I love just in, in your talk kind of the different stages and, you know, everything from just better traffic controls and getting trains to places on time and, and medical. Um, but a lot of what we do tends to come back to, you know, behavior, mm. right? And I think there's a, there's a line in terms of tracking and, and doing things that can be either overly intrusive or, or even creepy, and we've seen examples and, and you know the Facebooks and the Googles yeah. um, you know just any thoughts on just kind of and especially for the folks here of how we should be sort of approaching the the uh, practice of, of capturing user feedback and user tracking to deliver that experience um, yeah. but obviously there can be implications in that yeah so I'm just curious yeah. how you think about that um, I think transparency transparency is key it's not easy to do again yeah. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, just being more transparent with your consumer of what data is being captured, how it could be used, how it could potentially be used, uh, uh, just the steps of how you reach that a certain decision. Um, I think more and more companies are getting into that, uh, but that's the number one fact that I've seen. Look, uh, you know, what, what happened with the Facebook, right? Where uh, and I've worked, and this was even before big data came into space where we were doing like just traditional data warehousing and BI, but being able to consolidate data from different sources and external sources. So if you want to build a customer profile, you'd not only look at what the customer has shared with you, but also being able to pull in external sources like LexisNexis or Axiom and tying it all together to build a whole customer profile KYC, right? Uh, and you know when you are doing that uh, as, uh, as a data professional, as a technologist, you know it is being used to say, do it for personalized marketing or so, uh, you know, serve the consumer the right products. But you also know it could be used to influence that person's behavior in a way. Now you, if you could be using it to influence your, the person's behavior to buy your product, but it could also be used to influence in a different way. We all, you know, as technologists, you always have to be aware of how that technology can be used in a negative way. You know, technology by itself, what we build is not good or bad. It's always who uses it and how it's used. I think we don't put enough thought into, we, we, we put all the energy into solving a specific problem, but not enough thought into how can this technology be used in a negative way. What if this technology is handled by bad actors? And AI is just aggravating the situation and bringing a lot of things to light, uh, which should be part of your very early on in the process, right? Making sure that you put the right guardrails in place so that, the techno that you can actually prevent the bad actors from misusing the technology. 
Right, I often, you know, it's interesting in, in, in academics and, and, and you tend to, you know, it's the pursuit of answers, yeah. right? And, uh, and a lot of us in this room and, you know, the philosophers, we call them because we can debate pretty much anything um, from just, you know, whether it's algorithms, whether it's implementations, whether it's operations. I think there's an importance sometimes in, in our world to, to actually ask ourselves, are we even, you know, is this, is this a question worth pr pr pursuing, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Are, are we pursuing things that are going to have that impact or what the negative consequences can be? Um, you know, I, I liked how you sort of framed, I, I never really thought about the different stages and kind of where we are in, in, in adoption. And if we go back to sort of stage one, where we're kind of at the, the basic building blocks of, yeah. of where this, this technology can go, how are we doing even there? Because, um, you know, what we like to do is obviously we want to bring more of these capabilities to market and we see varying degrees of, of sophistication, of, of skill sets. Um, you know, are, are we making progress <laughs> as, as a whole, as a collective, or is this still something that, you know, Silicon Valley and, and Highway 101 and, and that is sort of monopolizing today? Yeah. Or? So obviously, so I get to work across different enterprises and different domains, and obviously there are some domains which have all traditionally has been data rich and needs that for compliance purposes. So you know there is there's much more advances in terms of narrow intelligence in that space. And I'm talking about the financial industry, sure, yeah, and the retail and e-commerce. You know, since the internet, that has boomed, and there's tons of data which really drove. The whole AI, you know, absolutely made yeah. AI real. search as well, so, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. right, made it real. Uh, but there are uh, certain industries like manufacturing where you know there's bit, you know it's g just getting started. There's fits and starts. There's very narrow solutions that is in play, but it's solving a very specific problem. I don't and, and given you know what we do with AI and since the data is so crucial and the context, the domain knowledge is so important. We're not making as much progress as we would in the manufacturing space compared to, say, say an e-commerce or sure. retail space. Yeah, yeah. And, and it seems like the the you know the necessity from the beginning of e-commerce was about surfacing products, discovery, right? Mm -hmm. Because clearly mm -hmm. the ROI was was there, and you could see the return on the investments and those kinds of things. I think in some of these other areas, while there's sort of more aspirational goals. The, the actual, like the absolute impact is sort of less yeah. understood. And I'll yeah. also add one more thing. In addition to that, it's the culture of the industry. Really interesting. That is yeah. so crucial. And I, I've worked in really large firms, really old companies. And what, we'll see, what we see is, you know, change is hard. Even though I was giving that example of how much we've changed <laughs> over time, it's, it's not easy. It's anything that's pushing you out of, the com um, out of your comfort zone is hard. And you can build the best predictive model that's going to predict when a, a particular machine on the factory floor might go down. But for a person who has been doing this job for 35 years, who's always trusted his gut instinct on when that machine might fail, it's very hard for that person to trust um, a, a computer program telling them that, yes, you need to take care of this, right? It, that, adoption just, and that adoption just doesn't come naturally. And at that point, I think your project has failed because if nobody's using your 100% you know, accurate model, right. it's a failed project. So, and that's where the, the design thinking part really comes into play uh, of you know, how do you make sure that you're just not focused on building the model, but you're also making sure you are able to drive adoption, present it in a way that's more acceptable to the end user, the consumer. I think it goes a little bit back to like, you know, are, are we solving the right questions, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I mean, we, we see this as a software company, a lot of everyone's got ideas and features and things that we want to do, but really understanding, you know, again, the, the users and, and sort of what they're looking for reminds me a lot too of, of sort of ag tech, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of really innovative opportunities and, and things that people are doing. And I've even, I've, I've worked alongside some folks that have gone after, gone after these opportunities and they often say, you know, I've come up with better ways to measure groundwater and better ways to predict X or Y, but then you're up against someone who's, you know, my, my, my grandfather, my grandfather's father, and, you know, we've been doing this for hundreds of years and yeah. we have these techniques. So, so yeah. that change, not only is it, is it, is it difficult, but, but it's questionable whether it's even necessary when you've got right. these modes that are sort of working. Um, to bring it back to your, I think that the transparency thing is, is really important and that's something I've, I've thought a lot about as well in terms of as we go deeper into, you know, tracking information, extracting information and, and, and really then when this goes wrong um, and, you know, there's been cases like recently 
uh, with Amazon where they tried to use AI as a way to sort of process resumes and find candidates in what was supposed to be an unbiased process. Yeah. And yeah. suddenly, you know, you, you looked at the demographic and, and it was very, uh, I'll call it monochromatic, yes. <laughs> right? A lot of people looking very similar who ended up kind of getting opportunities for jobs. Where does that transparency then sort of translate into, you know, responsibility when something goes wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, how, how should organizations sort of approach it? Because mistakes are going to happen, yeah. right? And, and when we're in this space where, where things are changing so quickly and, and we want to fail fast, yeah. um, you know, just propensity for, for, for accidents, propensity for these types of situations uh, to occur are, are pretty high. Um, does that transparency sort of translate back to then how we respond to these issues? We yeah. could probably look at a couple examples where, we maybe not have followed up the way we should yeah, have or, or responded yeah. the way we should have, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think Amazon did the right thing by pulling the algorithm out, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it, the window in which that it was running, I think for over a year yeah. and uh, before they caught it. So, uh, you, you know, the day, and you learn from that lesson and you move, uh, you know, you implement it and you move on and you, they're going back to the old method of doing it more manually. Um, and it's, it is, it is a, you know, the organization, the creator of the technology has to take full responsibility of what they build. I, I think unless and until you put the responsibility back on the creator, that onus is not going to come naturally of making sure full, to fully test it, to fully, you know, put in the guardrails so that it doesn't go rogue. Right, absolutely. Yeah. I also want to say we, we have some uh, microphones around the room, so if anybody wants to, I believe they're on either side, so if anybody has questions, please, I know it's still kind of early, so we'll, we'll let you off the hook, but there's definitely an opportunity to come up and ask me some questions as well. Well, that's fantastic. I think, um, you know, I, I kind of want to dig in a little more around sort of the, the human for AI element and, and some of the goals and, and, and really some of the opportunities there, because I think as, as, as folks in this room and practitioners, again, there's, there's an opportunity to be leaders. Yeah. And, and when you think about inclusion, and, and like you said, there was sort of looking through, through women in tech, but again, back to this sort of diversity of thought, and especially as we know, it's one thing to, in fact, you know, manufacturing and, and figure out when a part is broken and, and ship a replacement, but as we're sort of shaping the way we interact with the world, right, yeah. through, through, through mobile, and, 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 and again, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's content, right, yeah. and, and sort of sharing news, does that, you know, that sort of social economic piece of it start to come in as well to, you know, have folks who perceive things maybe differently, rank things kind of differently. And is that sort of, is, it, is the mission evolving, I guess, is sort of my question. Um, yeah, and especially for this community, right? And this is a t very technology focused, com uh, you know, community. But I think uh, as technology is becoming more and more prominent, as, you know, we're doing, going through the next industrial revolution, it is our responsibility to br bring the others along with us. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to have studied this, to be part of this as we are shaping this technology, but are we doing enough to bring everybody else up with us? Are we doing enough to educate everybody else? And it, it's, it's not easy. It's uh, obviously none of the you know, good things are easy to do, right? But I think if each one of us can educate one non-technical person to get them understand about AI or the technologies we're working on because they do use it in their day-to-day -day life, right? I think it is so important for us to you know, own up, take that responsibility. We are in a good spot today, right? Think of the time of when the steam engine or when that wave was going on, right? Today we are recreating human intellect into machines or anything that you do as well. How do we explain it in simple words to a non-technical person? And you know, I think one fear I've heard, uh, even when I started Humans for AI from actually from some of the academia and product management community was, oh no, 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 we can't train you know, non-technical people about AI. And that's not true, right? Uh, and I forget who said it, but whatever you do should be explainable in an easy enough way. That means you truly understood the concept. Uh, if we stop thinking about it as competition, uh, you know, not think of it as competition, but as something of doing it for the greater good. Because what we're doing today is going to impact mankind for the rest, you know, rest of their lives, right? I, I love what you said about, like, just, just language, right? Because, I mean, I think language has such an impact on our performance, on our perception of what's possible. And I think it's important as practitioners in particular when we're sort of seen as sort of 
practicing these 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 magic arts, right? Yes. And that sort of sends, sets a perception that then gets carried forward, where other folks go, okay, well, there's words and phrases and things that I don't understand, therefore I'm just gonna shut off, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a really limiting factor, even to us just as, as, as human beings, in terms of where our performance comes from and where our perception of what's possible comes from. And so that's, that's really interesting. It looks like we have a question over here. Thank you. Oh, it's a microphone. <laughs> they might, do we have that? I think it's on, uh, is it on now? Is it on? There we go. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, you just got to get really close. So I wanted to share some very good news and ask a question of the audience. Um, the good news, um, you might look up girlsintechnology.org, uh, which is a DC-based organization run by a group called Women in Technology. And um, we, you, I'm sure all of you have heard of Girls Who Code, which is a, a very a nationwide organization. But I think something that the AI community can do, uh, you could model after the cybersecurity community, because they've begun initiatives based in high schools, bringing uh, cybersecurity mm -hmm. education to high schools. And I don't know why we couldn't do the same thing with AI. Absolutely. So my question to the audience is, how many of you volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> I see one hand. Oh, I see a few <laughs> hands. So how is this done? How this is done is just what you're talking about, which is how do you get these concepts to a young audience? And yeah. the way you do it is you bring professionals to interact with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis after school. So it means you have to, t so companies who need to support things, large and small, um, are you giving your employees an opportunity to say, show up at a school once, a this is how Cyber Patriot does it. Uh, and we've got a whole, a whole thing going with Cyber Patriot, which is a high school competition and they now sponsor all girl teams, and that's what Women in Technology has taken on. But it means your employees need to show up at a school at 3.30 in the afternoon once a week mm -hmm. for the whole, most of the school year. Not the whole school year, but most of the school year. Some companies support it, some people just use their, that's how we spent our yeah. summer vacations. So I think that the way to do it, um, we do this in partnership with universities, and particularly the University of Maryland, um, now has their computer science women's participation up nearly to 50%, which is normally it's about 12% at most mm -hmm. universities. So it is doable, it's going on, it's been going on for about 15 years, so we're kind of a, a really well-kept secret. But I just wanted to share that because all of you can participate, and if you're not volunteering, go to your company and see if they'll support <laughs> it. If yeah. they won't support it, you can do it anyway. Um, but the way to do this is very grassroots. Uh, there's a great, very yep. good movie called um, Code Girl, which talks about a similar competition and how the interaction really takes place. And it's really at a very face-to-face, one-on-one level. They need to see the women who participate in all their different roles, technical as well as project managers and program managers. Um, but they also need their male allies to, to support them as well. So there's my pitch. <laughs> we can talk about it at the ladies' lunch, too. Awesome. Thank you. Well, and I think what, what, you, what you touched on is, is going back to just like in being intentional. Right, and I think with, with a lot of these things, whether it's the way we address bias, whether it's the way that we respond to incidents that happen, whether it's the way we reach out into the community, it's, it's having that intention as an organization is sort of the first step. And yes. without that intention, you know, we, we always want to think that, I mean, even for me as a, as a CEO, that, oh, we've got great people, they're, they're going to do great things. Well, you know, again, we're, we're, we're human beings, we have so many different signals that we're processing mm -hmm. at every given time that if we're not being intentional about the motions that we want to take, then uh, we're not going to see that, that impact. Yeah, and I think one of it is also, you know, if you look at the traditional geek or nerd, it's always been, you know, more isolated, more heads down. Get, I, I used to be like that too, you know. You know, me and my computer, and you just program and you, that's it, right? Uh, but uh, really, we are at that cusp of uh, the, you know, the change right now. We are the trigger, we are driving that change. So it's time for us to rise out of it and, uh, you know, it, it really bring up the rest of the people. I, I just, it, it, it goes against our grain of who we are, sure. I think, to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not how, you know, a, a nerd is perceived, so to speak. But for us, now is the time. Yeah. Let's see another question. Uh, thank you. Um, my question's with regards to um, the distribution of wealth. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S., the... 1% of the population holds about 90% of the wealth. Is there a risk that AI will further exacerbate that situation and concentrate the wealth even more into the hands of the few? 
Um, do you I have some thoughts on that, but oh, please okay. you start. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll go first, and then you know I would love to hear perspective. Um, I think um, so. There, there's a number of uh, initiatives going on, right, from global basic income to universal basic income to uh, you know making sure that people who lose their jobs get some kind of basic income. But that doesn't really equate the wealth equation. There's definitely a population that is, uh, hoard, you know, has most of the wealth now, and it has switched to more on the technology side. But again, I think it's part of the evolution. It, it, it will shift to that next wave of individuals or industries that rules this. Um, it does seem like today, if you look at it, we all live in the Amazon world, right? Everything is being run by Amazon. But I, I do think, um, AI is going to help even it out if we do it right. And that's the crucial part. Yeah, I think where I, I get concerned <laughs> with, with, with some of the innovation that's happening and in, in, in regards to sort of wealth distribution, but, but even access is, is a lot of the things that we're seeing around healthcare, yeah. right? I mean, you talked about, you know, even uh, genetic manipulation and, and, and these things. And so I think we need to be hyper aware of, of the impact that accessibility or, or making certain technologies accessible that have to do with our health, that have to do with our quality of life are being ev evenly distributed. Because it's, you know, we've seen this in, in, in the past in terms of where just having simple access to things, simple access to technology. Um, I see this a lot in, in the communities that I try to work with in terms of, you know, whether you have a computer at home, whether you have mm -hmm. parents who are working in professional environments and they're bringing some of that expectation back into home. And so that can have such a, a, a shaping effect on, on the way, one, that you perceive the world, so back to sort of the, you know, what's possible and where you see your potential. Um, but as we get into, you know, the have and have nots around, you know, whether you can survive certain illnesses, whether you can actually, you know, receive certain synthetic manipulations, which will extend life and quality of life, um, that makes me really nervous. But I think yeah. that awareness is something that as long as we, we are, you know, consciously and intentionally going down this path, we can, we can prevent some, some even further sort of, uh, you know, uh, uneven distribution, if you will, yeah. of access. So I'll add two more things to it. Your, your comments, uh, you know, uh, provoke these thoughts. One is, you know, in the past five years at least, I'm seeing a lot of focus around impact investing or investing for good that it's not merely about you know, driving commercial value, but how do you actually, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs and VCs who are now investing in th uh, you know, technologies that's meant for social good, whether it is making healthcare accessible to all or education accessible to all. And I'm really you know, driven by what, the change that I'm seeing in the past few years. There's that general awareness that's coming, but it's still at a high level. So you know, my hope is, like, think about education. AI can, you know, not only do personalized education, but it can potentially, you know, combine with other technologies, take education to the most remote parts of the world. And the example that, you know, that motivates me is, I believe that somebody in this world has a cure for cancer, or has, you know, some of the toughest problems. They have the answers to that. But just because they don't have access, you know, they've not been educated. They don't have the right connections. They've never been able to share that cure or that answer with anybody till now. So can we leverage technologies? So, you know, I believe that there is an 80-year-old woman somewhere in the remote part of Africa who has a cure for cancer in her head, who has that solution, but you know, can AI help us reach that woman and she can communicate to, to us and take it, you know, to the rest of the world. So that's why I'm so hopeful of see, you know, one is the actual trend in impact investing and the other is, you know, make, taking these technologies accessible to all. And even taking, I mean, I, I think there's, there's a true economic benefit, mm -hmm. right, that, that, that comes from sort of maintaining a, a better balance and an empowerment and education and a healthier society. I mean, these are things that, you know, I think a lot of us feel are, are, are sort of social justice causes that, that we care about.
but I often try to even bring in the element of the folks who might think like, oh, this is just some, you know, hippy dippy, I'm a capitalist, yeah. I'm this and that. It's like, no, there's a true economic benefit for yeah. having healthier societies, more educated societies, providing better access, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, you look at some of Facebook's attempts to bring internet to, to remote parts of the world, and while it's altruist, altruistic in nature, and I think there's a lot of great intentions, but, but let's face it, there's a lot of users. Yes. <laughs> and so yeah, I think we can, we can sort of drive that, sort of the impact investing um, in, in a way that people who may not be as affected or motivated by some of the social impact that, that you know, making them aware of sort of what the, the, the economic or market impacts can be by just getting back to that access and then that awareness, you know, mm -hmm. again, I, I really believe in this, this idea around potential just being limited to perception. Yeah. And if we can change perceptions, if we, if, we, if we can raise the bar, if we can change language, you know, that the impact that that can have on, on us as a society and, and, and a global society, which yeah. is great because we are now a global society as much as, you know, some of our politicians and others try to tell us how, yeah, how, yeah, how yeah. separated we are. I mean, we're all connected. I mean, yeah. we talked backstage that, you know, I got into programming when I was a kid in the 90s and, and it was really about that first time I got on a BBS and connected with somebody in Australia and it yeah. just blew my mind. Yeah. You know, and there was no like long, I couldn't even call Chicago where my grandparents were without it costing a fortune. Yeah. So just yeah. having that connectivity was something that just it inspired me to want to really dive into this. Um, let's do one on this side of the room and then we'll, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, we all know that the current state of AI depends heavily on big data. You need a lot of data. Um, is there any initiatives that are guaranteeing equal opportunities for startups? Because you need the data to Great. do any inventions. I mean, the question is, can you invent in your garage like you used to with software? You, you just need to sit and write software. But now, even if you have the intention and knowledge to build an AI system, it's not easy to get yes. the data, are we fighting creating these huge monopolies yeah. that they're the only ones that can do any invention? Can I, in my garage again, build something? Yeah, there's, there's a, at le I know of at least five, six initiatives, which is about, may, you know, it is more about op opening out data sources, right? Because you fundamentally need data to build these AI products. Uh, so as long as it, you can remove the PII information, personally identifiable information, there is uh, quite a few initiatives that's going on by domain to making that a, a data more accessible. And the idea behind it is uh, if we can open out that data, then you will see more products coming out through it, right? You will see more AI products. So there's a commercial aspect to it, but. Uh, there is uh, right from like AI for good to open AI to there is uh, smaller startups like uh, one which I'm involved is called Clean Advantage and what they're doing is they have all these um, whether it's a healthcare data or IoT data how do you remove the personally identifiable information and give it out to the world and see what comes back right there's definitely a lot of uh, initiatives going on both on the uh, entrepreneurial side but also on the academia side yeah that, that's a fantastic question in fact when you, when you just as you were speaking it kind of gave me this little fear <laughs> cuz just <laughs> realizing that you're absolutely right i mean the potential for sort of creating these monopolies around data um, i think in, in addition to some of the open ai i mean a lot of the open data projects that are mm -hmm. that are out there as well and you know, I think of the folks in, in this room who, who represent a lot of large organizations who, who have access to a lot of data. And just something to think about, I did process this before, is, is are there ways for industry to sort of drive more of that collaboration and more of that access? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's obviously cases where they perceive you know, competitive advantages and, and those types of things. But um, there's also an opportunity, I think, cross industry to, to, to elevate. Um, based on having better insights and, and, and better access. So I, I just, I challenge everyone here as you go home and you go back to work to just, just think about, you know, the types of, the type of data that your organization is collecting and where else that might actually be impactful or might be useful. And, you know, it can be for things that are, you know, socially impactful, um, but there's ways that we can leverage between businesses. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of questions when I, I go into, 
different verticals and, and, and working, whether it's, you know, with, with home improvement companies, automotive companies, banks, and they always want to know, you know, what are other folks doing? Yeah. And it's not anything nefarious. They're not trying to steal secrets or hit us yeah. up for information. Yeah, I think yeah, it's yeah. just more of their, they want ideas, yeah. you know, and they want to learn from people who, who have different experiences and can bring those experiences to light. So uh, really, really good question. And it's something I'm, I'm going to think about a lot more as, as we leave today. Uh, question on this side. Yeah, good, good morning. I want to come back to diversity for a second. Um, earlier, you stated that uh, a ch there's a chance to even out biases in bringing in uh, people from different backgrounds into your team, which is uh, y quite quite a good uh, solution f if you got the um, possibilities to hire those people if they are available and if you can pay them. Uh, so uh, later, you said. Um, the uh, AI should open to everyone, and that's quite too, uh, true also. So when that happens, uh, small teams and individuals and whoever's going to work with AI um, on a, maybe on a non-professional level won't have the possibilities to hire a diverse team. So what, what can we do to secure diversity on that level? Is there is there a market for diversity as a service? Or do we need um, government regulation here? What's your thought about that? That's a great question. I think that's the, really first time, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the first time I've heard diversity as a service. Interesting. <laughs> huh. I'll have to think about it. But no, that's a great question. Uh, I think, l look, uh, as long as we are, are aware, our companies are aware, there will be that pressure to build, you know, to make sure there is more diversity and inclusion. The challenge, uh, you know, that most companies have is that we are under pressure to deliver certain business outcomes. And, you know, there's no, you know, training period or there is no time to invest in bringing somebody who doesn't have that exact fit to up to speed. So how do we actually channel the budget to, you know, to do it? Uh, there's, there's a lot of companies who hire chief diversity officer whose charter should be part of, you know, whose budget and charter should cover this. But I also see almost, you know, that, that almost has become a caricature now. If you start looking at, you know, all the chief diversity officers of all the companies, they all look alike. So, you know, that, that itself is becoming one of those checkbox things. So finding that balance is important. I also think it's a lot of this is, just in, you know, just like that lady earlier said, is getting you know more diverse people excited from an early stage, exactly. and that's really hard to do, right? Because when you don't see a role model or you don't see somebody who f f looks like you, it's really hard to aspire to be like that. Um, so I, you know, as long as we approach it with both from both ends, we can solve it. Do you, do you? Uh, I have a lot, a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, I mean, this is something, I mean, personally, th that I struggle with, right? I, I'm, I'm an African-American in technology. I, I grew up in the East Bay, in the Bay Area, which, you know, you think about the Bay Area and all of the wealth and, and, and all the prosperity and how sort of uh, exclusive that's been to certain populations and how, you know, we, we, we go about these sort of diversity initiatives and we say, we're going to go build pipelines from historically black colleges in, in these different areas yep. when, you know, I look across the Bay Bridge and I'm saying, you know, there is this huge predominantly black and Latino population that is not participating and is not, you know, benefiting from this wealth and, and even worse is being displaced by a lot of what's sort mm -hmm. of happening here. And so I think that, you know, while the intentions are good, that companies need to be more thoughtful in their approaches. This goes back to, you know, are, are, are we asking the right questions? Or are, are we sort of solving the right things? Um, you know, as a startup CEO, one of the challenges we have is obviously, you know, hiring is just difficult. Competition mm -hmm. is difficult. You know, we're based in San Francisco, we're based in Raleigh, we're based in the Cambridge UK. I mean, these are just very competitive markets and large companies are coming in and, and, and monopolizing talent to a certain degree. And so there's always going to be pressure to try to secure candidates as quickly as we can, to secure talent as quickly as we can. The only thing I tell my team is just to, you know, really challenge your thinking. Yeah. Right. There, there's a term in the Silicon Valley that I hate, and that term is meritocracy, <laughs> because what meritocracy doesn't really include are our personal experiences. Mm. Right. And, and where's the meritocracy of somebody who's had to go up against the status quo, who was the only woman in their computer science class, who was the only person of color in their science classes? You know, mm -hmm. there's a certain merit 
that yes. comes with that that we don't calculate. We don't, we don't actually put value on those experiences. And so again, even as an open source community, if we're gonna go back and say, well, this person doesn't have a GitHub account, therefore they can't contribute or you know, they're not a good fit for what we do, but this is a person who came from a different social economic background, put themselves through school, single parent household, was able to get into college, was able to learn technology, and then from there got a job at a large corporation like a GE, yes. and that is such a great accomplishment, and there's so much that, 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 there, that you can benefit from that life experience. Yeah. But especially, you know, again, I'll criticize Silicon Valley in particular, and, and I love the fact that a lot of people here are from other places, uh, but that's something we need to do a lot better at. And it's something that we need to encourage folks to start looking at other dimensions of what creates talent and what creates character and how we can apply that. Now, we're gonna have skill sets needed. You know, we've got certain jobs yeah. that require certain experiences and certain backgrounds, but I think we just, we all need to just kind of challenge ourselves and, and really challenge our, our peers in terms of how are we quantifying skills and experience and what are we not looking at? Yeah. Um, and, and sorry, this is something I get really worked yeah, up yeah, about yeah. because I, I see it all the time. Um, love to talk more offline about that, by the way. Uh, another question, we've got a couple more minutes, so if there's anything else, or if anybody else wants to come up as well. Um, it was mentioned earlier that transparency is important um, for having the public have confidence in these techniques and in data collection and in the use of AI. Um, but I'd like to think a little bit more concretely about what we mean by transparency. Yeah. Because individual isolated transparency of saying, allowing an individual to see what data is being collected about them is an important step, but it only goes so far. And I would submit that most people care far more about what is being done with the data that's collected about them and collected about the entire community in aggregate than they do about the individual data that's collected about them. And so I think that transparency of individual isolated data collection um, is of limited use, and I'd like to see more talk about the transparency of action and I think the only way to do that, it, like what's done with the data, and the only way to do that is in aggregate. Um, I mean, this data would be useless to the institutions, the, the companies that's that are collecting the data. It would be useless in isolation. And I think it's similarly misleading or useless in isolation from a transparency perspective. Um, and I don't really see a way around it. You can't. Um, you can't evaluate what you can't measure. And I think the action that's being taken with this data is really important to audit, and it's important for the public to audit. And I think trusting individual uh, companies to have internal audit processes is a huge leap of faith. And I'm wondering if there's a more um, public, open uh, way that we can talk about aggregate transparency. Yeah, and it's a tough one, right? Like, and I think GDPR is a first step, but it's focused on a very, you know, it's really talking about how can you withdraw your data if you need be. And, and you know, there's different ways to look at it because if your data has already been part of building a model, you know, how do you get out of that, right? So uh, I think there's nuances. Uh, what I'll say is, uh, and going back to the transparency, how do we share? One of the simplest example I can think of is just be being able to say it's not only we're not just you know getting the data that you provide us, but we are also pulling in your data from all the other external open source you know data sources that's there, or we're paying for to buy your data from vendors who sell your data, right? Be you know as a consumer, if you knew that your data was not just what you gave to the, at this platform on this website, but it, the, this company was also buying your data from vendors like LexisNexis or Axiom, and then, you know, even uh, Facebook sells data, right? So being able to say that we are looking at your data as a whole, I don't think that comes out today, right? You think you went to a website, you gave this information, that's the only information they have. And we are tech savvy, so we know they're probably doing it. But just that basic level of transparency to start with. Right, but even even that is very focused on the individual level and GDPR as well. What yeah. information do people have about you as an individual? And I think in order to evaluate what's being done, it's important to have the larger picture. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you just you might have a vaguely creeped out sense of what <laughs> information people have about you, 
but when the rubber hits the road, you have no idea what mm -hmm. is being done with that data. Uh, I mean, I, I think what, what, what Bina said is, is so spot on in terms of, you know, th there's, a, there's a point in which I think we need to start to educate Right, because there's, there's definitely a lack of awareness. So as you were talking, I was thinking of this, you know, we talk about sort of data transparency and things like GDPR, and to your point, there's sort of isolated silos of, okay, what information is, of mine is out there, and, and, you know, can I have the right to be forgotten or deleted? But, but algorithmic transparency is probably what we're talking about here in terms of how things get used. It reminds me of, you know, I've got a lot of, uh, like, my, my Facebook friends are sort of split between sort of tech savvy and not so tech savvy. And what ends up happening is that there's often a lot of this sort of, um, panic will occur because someone will hear about, oh, the iPhone's tracking my movement or Google's doing this and, and everyone starts to freak out and they'll post statements on their wall like Facebook may not collect my data. And I'm like, I don't think it works this way, yeah, no. you know. Um, but but what, it, what I always reflect on, and I think a lot of us as being more kind of technical savvy, is that, okay, so you're going to turn off location tracking on your phone. You, do you realize that every time you get on a Wi-Fi, every time you swipe a bus pass, I mean, we're sharing so much information. And so I don't, I don't think we have an answer to what you're saying because it's, it's, a, it's a really deep problem. But I think the first step is really about that education, mm -hmm. right, and making more people aware. This stuff isn't rocket science. No offense to the people in the room who have uh, <laughs> built careers on, on, on this sort of perception of, you know, we're doing these, these, these dark arts or, or whatever they may be. But so many of these things are just normal concepts that people can understand. And it's, again, that language and how we sort of change the language to sounding like something that's foreign to people to just in, in, in cases where they understand. You know, you're logging into a Wi-Fi uh, inside of an airport. You know, think about what that means from a device ID, from a location ID. Think about how that data then can be provided to other service providers. Um, it's scary, it really is, because there, there's so much opportunity for you know, whether, whether there's security breaches, whether things can be abused, but I think the more awareness that we have, it's definitely gonna be important. Um, so we're, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. I think Bina's gonna be here at least for the, the morning and, and through the afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is so much fun, and I, I, I look forward to continuing this discussion, and I hope everybody here um, has something more to, to think about and to bring these discussions back into your organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you.